Common in Minnesota's iron ranges is taconite, an iron-containing rock first considered useless because of its low iron content. However, by 1951, a company called Reserve established a commercial taconite production facility at Silver Bay. Reserve's success attracted more taconite producers, saving Minnesota's economy, changing the steel industry, and preventing foreign ore dependence. When Reserve was sued over their disposal of non-iron tailings into Lake Superior in 1973, the judge ruled in favor of the environment over business for the first time in U.S. history, marking a turning point in the role of government and business in environmental stewardship. Both turning points caused by Reserve continue to impact many aspects of American life, industry, and politics. In 1913, E.W. Davis of the University of Minnesota Mines Experiment Station, MES, received a taconite sample. He found that it was silica-based containing about 30% iron ore and tiny particles. In 1922, a taconite refining plant was established at Babbitt, Minnesota, but failed because of business problems and subpar processing. Iron ore of all grades must be smelted in a blast furnace to remove the oxygen atoms. The product made at Babbitt did not reduce as well as traditional ore. The MES researched taconite almost continuously from then to the early 1950s to make a product that was not only competitive, but better than natural ore to make up for the cost of additional processing. This was accomplished by rolling crushed, magnetically separated ore in a drum filled with clay and firing the pellets that were formed. It was found that these pellets reduced faster and more completely in a blast furnace than irregularly sized chunks of traditional ore. E.W. Davis holds the patent on this process and is a person central to the future of Minnesota mining. By 1939, a company called Ogilvy Norton created a reserve mining company to buy up the facilities at Babbitt. They thought of taconite as a reserve that could be used in the distant future should a workable processing method be developed. Armco Steel came in as a partial owner. Soon the onset of World War II and wartime production depleted high-grade ores faster than expected, putting pressure on mining companies to consider new sources of ore like taconite, or outsource operations. Reserve decided that because of the massive amounts of water that would be taken in and tailings that would be produced, the plant would need to be on a lake shore where the tailings could be dumped into the lake to be feasible. They chose a spot on Lake Superior north of Beaver Bay in 1944 and began purchasing land the next year. The ore would be mined at Babbitt and shipped to the Superior plant on a private railroad. The plant would require its own power plant, using more water and electricity than the entire city of Duluth. It would employ 2,500 people. Before taking the next step and applying for building permits, Reserve commissioned the MES to conduct a study on the effects of tailings in a lake environment. They showed that the tailings would sink to the bottom of a natural trench near the plant, not affecting lake appearance or wildlife. It is likely that they weren't able to duplicate lake occurrence, or the sheer amount of tailings that would be dumped over decades of plant operation. They began applying for building permits in 1947. Taking water out of the lake and putting tailings back in worried fishermen, naturalists, sightseers, and Duluth officials who feared that the water would be poisoned and discolored by the tailings, affecting people and wildlife. Many of the opposition leaders were convinced of Reserve's side, and the others were no match for Reserve's legal team and growing local support. The permits were given under the condition that the water couldn't be muddied further than three miles from the plant. Republic Steel joined Reserve in 1950 as an equal partner with Armco. Both were interested in pellets, but the refining method could be used on other ores sourced from outside Minnesota. In September 1951, Reserve announced that the plant it had designed would be built, producing 3.75 million tons of pellets per year. A company town was built for the plant and named Silver Bay in 1954. The plant was named for E.W. Davis in 1956. The establishment of the E.W. Davis works at Silver Bay was not only a turning point in that it proved that taconite could be feasible, but it also pioneered a new business model. Instead of reserve being independently operated, Republic and Armco used all the pellets that were produced, cutting out a middleman and lowering costs. As more plants were built with this model, more interest was put behind mining and preliminary processing and legal issues, and taconite was able to all but replace the depleted traditional ores in the United States. By the late 1960s, environmental awareness was increasing throughout the country, marked by the formation of the EPA in 1970. Even with the new agency, every environmental case until 1974 cited against the environment as in the Ohio vs. Wyandotte Chemical Company case of 1971 over mercury pollution in Lake Erie. 
The district courts believed that the Supreme Court had jurisdiction, but the Supreme Court ruled that the district courts did, and refused the case, left in insufficient hands Wyandotte won. The courts were wary of the unfamiliar territory of environmental law. The two tailings chutes dumped enough to fill a train car every two minutes, and sediment extends the shore one-third of a mile from the plant. Despite this, scientific data showed that the tailings weren't affected the lake. Going on observations of decreased hulls, fishermen believed that the tailings were damaging spawning grounds. The water was muddied in the area outside the three-mile allowance. One of the EPA's first major cases was a lawsuit against reserve. This worried reserves workers who feared that the plant would shut down, costing them jobs and property value. They allied themselves with reserve. As both sides tried to find evidence in the water, Dr. Phil Cook of the EPA found fibers similar to asbestos, a known carcinogen in the muddied areas. They were tracked all the way to the water supplies of Duluth and Two Harbors, which weren't filtered at the time. This was covered by national news, raising national interest in the issue. The trial began in August 1973, presided over by Judge Miles Lord. Three states and multiple environmentalist groups joined the suit. Reserve scientists maintain that the fibers weren't similar enough to asbestos or in high enough concentration to pose a risk. They then claimed that it wasn't possible to dump the tailings on land. They were subpoenaed by EPA lawyer Byron Starnes to reveal any documents about on land disposal. They had no choice but to bring in boxes of documents, including detailed engineering plans. In April 1974, after these revealed Reserve's blatant lie, Lord accused Reserve of stalling for time to make money off the doomed operation. Lord called C. William Verity, Reserve's chairman, to the stand. He said, Now, can you get this thing out of the water? Can you stop poisoning the people downstream and the air and so forth? Can you figure out a way not to make so much dust? Verity's response was a prepared speech, containing the words, We don't have to, we won't, at its heart. This infuriated Lord. That afternoon, he ordered Reserve to stop dumping. He put 3,000 people out of work and eliminated one twelfth of the U.S.'s supply of iron ore. It was one of the greatest turning points in environmental law, the first time in United States history that a judge had ruled against business in favor of the environment. Reserve appealed the decision and won the right to continue dumping in Superior until they finished building an on-land disposal pond in 1980. The workers went back to work and normal production resumed. Taconite has provided massive economic benefits, most measurable in Minnesota, a direct turning point from the alternative course of depleted ore and economic ruin. The seven production facilities in Minnesota provide almost 69% of new ore in the U.S. In 2010, these facilities produced Minnesota's largest gross product output, added $3.2 billion to the regional economy, and provided 11,500 jobs with average earnings of $100,000. Because of the number of workers, as well as their families and equipment, many jobs and service industries like healthcare can be also be directly linked to taconite. 2012 data puts these spin-off jobs at 1.82 jobs per taconite job, almost tripling the number of careers made possible by the industry. The steel industry has been able to use taconite pellets to cut costs in energy use while avoiding foreign ore. The idea of using low-grade ore and the perseverance of people like E.W. Davis made this possible. More than 20 years later, the same operation was at the center of a multifaceted ideological turning point. Judge Lord's verdict became a reference for future cases, as the first of many to side against businesses in favor of the environment. He helped rewrite the complex relationships between the government, business, private individuals, and environmental stewardship. Delving deeper into these relationships, an even broader idea is spelled out. In the words of Byron Starnes, they're sort of balancing. Look at all the harm that would be caused by shutting it down. And that turned out to be one of the more interesting things from a legal point of view that the reserve case kicked off, this risk assessment analysis. Starnes means that no single factor can be weighed above others or even as a single factor. While reserve was degrading the environment, and by extension the fishing and tourism industries, it was also central to the economy. Lord was tasked not only with weighing the economy and environment against one another, but also how damage to the environment affects the economy and a multitude of other interconnected factors. Recently, this process showed up again in Minnesota in the Clean Water, Land, and Legacy Amendment of 2008. Between the transformation of the steel industry, salvation of Minnesota's economy, and ideological turning points caused by reserve, the operation has probably affected nearly every aspect of life in America, from the prices of everyday steel products and industrial equipment, to legislation, to Minnesotan life, reserve was at the forefront of a new era that continues today.